7.30, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody, I am Vivian New. I'm the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanted to welcome everybody to our program tonight. Uh, to, so I'm gonna go through just a few intro slides and then we're gonna launch into our two-part program tonight because we have one of our scholarship winners here to talk about his project as well as Andrea speaking about the wildflowers of the Bay Area. And when we do these programs, we actually have a team behind them. So besides the host, me, um, we also have a QA moderator who tonight is going to mean Madeline Morrow. And she will be asking questions um, to those speakers at the end of their presentations. And we also have a YouTube moderator for those of you who are on YouTube. So for both Zoom and YouTube, we do request that you at, put your questions into the chat and our moderators will make sure that those questions get um, are given to the presenter at the end of their talks. And I'm here on tech, which means I'm running Zoom and all the other stuff, the technical stuff in the background. And tonight, as I mentioned before, we actually have two speakers. So we're gonna be starting with our undergraduate scholarship winner um, from 2020, TJ Simonye, Simonye, sorry, TJ, I'm messing up your last name again, Simonye. And um, then Andrea will be speaking on Bay Area wildflowers. And we are here as one of the chapters of the California Native Plant Society. Um, if you're not familiar with the society, it is uh, the, foremost organization in California, actually in the in the world, protecting California's uh, native plants. We are a nonprofit environmental organization founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members, 35 chapters across the entirety of California, including and stretching beyond the border into Baja, California. We also have a chapter that focuses on mosses. Um, our chapter, covers Santa Clara Valley, which is Santa Clara County and the southern part of San Mateo County. And CNPS is all about saving California's native plants and their habitats. We do that with science, education, conservation, gardening, and we power the native plant movement. If you are not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. Um, the membership benefits include two great journals Fremontia, well, Fremontia, which is being renamed, and Flora, uh, our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, discounts at local nurseries. And most importantly, you will be helping with the conservation of all of this wonderful habitat, incredibly important habitat in California. So if you're not currently a member, I would love to have you join. Just go to cnps.org slash join and you can sign up online. Our chapter puts on quite a few events. So in addition to our talk tonight, we have a number of talks and activities coming up. Our photography group will be meeting on May 28th. And that is a fun meeting open to everybody um, where you can share your plant pictures, um, talk to other photographers about you know, tips on photography. But it's, uh, it's a really nice time. And you know, you don't have to be a photographer to attend. You can learn about plants and see lots of great pictures by going to it. Uh, in June, our first talk is on creating fire resistant habitat. Very, very important topic these days. And that will be given by Nikki Hanson on June 2nd. Um, on the following week, June 9th, we're gonna have another Going Native Garden Tour visit um, to a plant garden. And then uh, on June 16th, we will have a talk by David Greenberger covering a nine county photo tour of the Bay Area showing rare plants around the Bay. So that's all gonna be a lot of fun and there's always more uh, activities being scheduled. If you're not currently in our meetup group or on our weekly chapter news mailing list, uh, you can, if you join either of those things, you'll get notified as we schedule things. So as I mentioned before, the news list is a way to get a weekly notification. So it's not a ton of email, just a message each week, letting you know what's coming up. And you can do that by sending email to the 
address on your screen, or you can just go to our website, cnps-scv.org, and that information is there as well. Oops, I forgot to update this slide. So uh, it is not Native Plant Week. We do not have these specials right now. And in fact, uh, our, our nursery uh, is about to go on summer hiatus. So we are only going to be open through the end of May if you are interested in buying plants from us. And this is the way our chapter supports all our activities. Every penny um, from the nursery goes toward um, supporting our chapter programs and all our, our chapter period. Um, and the address to get to the nursery is there on your screen. You can just you can also find it just by going to cnps-scv.org and there's a link there to it. We have a lot of great plants. Um, you can also get t-shirts, books, and uh, those native plant live here signs. So you have through the end of May, and then after that, we will be closed through the summer. We'll be back in August. And if you like helping out with Zoom or YouTube and you're enjoying these talks and would like to help out, we could use more help. And uh, all you have to really do is be able to point and click and type. We'll train you on everything else. And if that sounds like something you'd be happy to help us with, please contact either Johanna Kwan or Madeline Morrow. Their email addresses are here on the screen. But you can also go to cnps-scv.org and you can find their information and more about the volunteer opportunities there as well. And uh, a little bit of housekeeping, but actually before I go into the muting your microphone part, I'm really interested in knowing who is here who has not been to one of our programs before. Um, if you don't mind, if this is your first time joining us, first of all, welcome. But we would love to know where you're from and how you found out about us. And if you could just type that into the chat, that would be great to hear. Um, I see that someone's having trouble hearing me, so I'm going to scoot a little bit closer. I hope everybody else is uh, okay hearing. But at this point, we are about to start our program, so I would appreciate it if everybody could make sure that their microphones are muted. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions about our the presentations, just type, do not, please do not unmute and ask your questions. Just type into the chat. And as I, we, I mentioned, we have moderators monitoring the chat. They will capture all those questions and ask the uh, presenters the, at the end of their, their talks. We do expect to wrap up by nine o'clock. And this talk is being shown both on YouTube and on Zoom. It'll be available in, immediately on Zoom as a recording. So if you uh, wanna look at it later, it'll be there for you to review. And so tonight's program is Wildflowers of the Bay Area by Andrea. But before Andrea talks, we have TJ Samadier from Cal Poly. He is Cal Poly um, San Luis Obispo. He is the winner of our undergraduate scholarship from 2020. And he has an amazing program um, that he's going to be working on. So TJ, if you don't mind, go ahead and share your slides uh, and tell us about what you're doing. Yeah. So can everyone see this? Hmm. Does it look good, Vivian? Yes, that looks great. Thank okay. you. Well, hey everyone, my name is TJ, and today I'm going to be talking about my project, which is titled X-ray fluorescence analysis of herbarium specimens, a path to the discovery of additional nickel hyperaccumulators in California. And if anything, if you can't hear me at any point, just interrupt me. So my project combines three unique areas of botanical research. First, I'm incorporating hyperaccumulators, which are a unique subset of plants that uptake unusual amounts of metals. I'm incorporating XRF technology, which is used to measure metal content. And lastly, I'm gonna be incorporating herbaria, which as you all know, are repositories of dried plant specimens. 
And so I want to start by talking about nickel hyperaccumulators. And nickel hyperaccumulators are the type of hyperaccumulators my project focuses on. There are about 650 nickel hyperaccumulator species across the world. And so here's a picture of the green nickel rich sap found in a tropical nickel hyperaccumulator species. But they grow on nickel rich soils such as serpentine, which we have scattered throughout our coastal ranges, well, all of our ranges actually. And what's remarkable is these concentrations that the hyperaccumulators uptake would be toxic to non hyperaccumulators. And so what classifies a hyperaccumulator for nickel is that it has greater than a thousand parts per million nickel for dry leaf tissue. And so scientists are intrigued why plants have evolved this unique ability. And the most promising hypothesis right now is called the metal defense hypothesis. And it's the idea that the nickel helps prevent insect herbivory. However, these plants are also being studied for their applications and they've been used before for phytoremediation, so cleaning up mine tailings and other heavy metal polluted soils. But they're also being investigated for a new process called phytomining. And so what that essentially means is the plants are grown on the metal rich soil, they're burned, and then this sort of bio ore is, is created, and then you can extract the metal from that. And so there's a lot of interesting applications with hyperaccumulators, and that's why I thought it'd be interesting to focus on them for my study. And so California has two nickel hyperaccumulators, and there are two serpentine endemics called Nosafe and Larry and Streptanthus polygoloides. And my research question is, why are there only two nickel hyperaccumulators in California and for that matter, all of North Carolina, all of North America, when, for example, New Caledonia, which is an island much smaller than California, has over 100 nickel hyperaccumulators. And I believe this is due to an understudy. And so my project is going to be analyzing other taxa to see if they can also hyperaccumulate in the hopes of discovering new hyperaccumulators. And so the first step would be focusing on the Brassicaceae family of California, because that is where both of these hyperaccumulators reside in. And so out of 409 total Brassicaceae of California, 44 of those are found on serpentine and could be possible candidates for hyperaccumulation. But there are 679 total taxa that can tolerate serpentine soil. And this comes from a, a database put together by Hugh Safford and Jesse Miller of Serpentine Affinity for California Plants. And so I feel with, with this large number that it's probable there are more than two hyperaccumulators, nickel hyperaccumulators in California. And so depending on the pace of my research, I will also dive into serpentine tolerant taxa of other families. But when I say analyze taxa, you may be wondering what exactly I mean. And so this is where the XRF technology comes in. So one of the most rapid ways to test for metal content of plants is using an X-ray fluorescence device and it essentially works by shooting an X-ray beam at a plant specimen. And then the refraction of that beam is used to calculate metal composition. And so Cal Poly has one of these devices. Um, but what's exciting about this technique is it's only been used two or three times in studies for plants and never before on plants in North America. And it isn't a new technology per se because it's typically used on denser materials such as soil and rock and it has a lot of applications in like metal, metal working. So, but it is however rare for plants. And so to use it on plants, I have to create a correction factor. And to do this, I'll need to collect at least five plant specimens covering a range of nickel concentrations. Um, so that would be all the way from the one to two parts per million nickel 
found in typical plants up to the highest found for Streptanthus polygoloides, which is about 15,000 parts per million. So you can see there's a really big range, but the idea is to collect some, collect five specimens and then scan them with the XRF device to get the raw XRF output. And then I can send those same samples to a lab for chemical analysis. So I'll get a true elemental nickel concentration. And then I can create a regression line comparing the XRF output with the chemical analysis and generate a correction factor that I can use when I use the XRF device on all the other plant specimens I want to study. And so this, these five samples are just for the calibration procedure. Um, so a lot of my work so far has just been trying to develop this protocol and come up with the methods because I haven't been able to start the, the um, measuring with all the delays due to COVID. And so I'm really excited to actually start measuring this stuff in the fall. But it would be really difficult if I had to go out into the field and collect plant specimens for every plant that I wanted to study all across California, because they're very far spread out. And so this is where herbaria comes in, because we as Californians are super lucky to have the consortium of California herbaria, which gives us access to millions of dry plant specimens. And so starting at Cal Poly's herbarium, I'll begin scanning herbarium or I'll begin scanning serpentine tolerant brassicaceae of California and then expand the search to other families. I also plan on visiting nearby herbaria such as the Santa Barbara herbarium and the San Jose State herbarium so I can access specimens that aren't available at Cal Poly. And I can also have specimens shipped into me if they're too far away for me to drive to. And so, once I develop that correction factor, the beauty of this method is I can scan hundreds of specimens a week because the XRF device only needs to scan each specimen for about 30 to 60 seconds before it determines the metal content. And so if the resulting nickel concentration is greater than a thousand parts per million, the plant can be classified as a hyperaccumulator. And so hopefully after I scan a lot of specimens and a lot of taxa, I will find some new hyperaccumulators or some other interesting information. And it's my goal to present these findings at the 10th International Conference on Serpentine Ecology in Ekaterinburg, Russia with my advisor next summer. And so that was that's it for me. Like I said, I, I've kind of just been developing the protocol so far. I'm really excited to start this project in the fall, but I want to conclude by acknowledging you all at the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society for providing me with the gracious scholarship. I'd also like to thank the Frost Summer Fellowship Program at Cal Poly for getting me started with this project last summer. My advisor, Dr. Raja Karuna at the Cal Poly GB Ecology Lab. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Joe Pollard, Chip Appel, and Dr. Josh Lutovsky at their respective posts because they helped me with the XRF technology. And so I'll take any questions at this point. Thank you, TJ. We have some questions here. Uh, one of them is, are there plants that can accumulate metals other than nickel? Yeah, so that's a really good question. There are other types of hyperaccumulators. Um, nickel tends to be the most widely studied because it is, it, nickel is pretty commonly found on serpentine soils. And so, but there's also hyperaccumulators for, say, cadmium. I think there's some for zinc and copper, but they just seem to be the most hyperaccumulators in for nickel. And another question is, can the XRF um, detect other metals? Yeah, so the XRF device 
it it gives a pretty complete metal or elemental concentration reading. So it'll it'll scan. I mean, I don't. It doesn't go through like all metals, but it'll scan most metals, most common metals. And so I don't know if I the readings would be super accurate if I tried to assess it for metals other than nickel because. I my correction factor is only based off of nickel, but it would give some sort of reading for other metals. Okay, and I see one more question. Why do you think uh, California only has three? I thought it was two hyperaccumulators. I thought you answered that, but it's good to say it again. Yeah, I mean, I just it just seems like this is an understudy, and so perhaps we're missing missing some and I guess it's possible there are only two but based on the trends from other locations other countries in other regions with serpentine soils our our number seems pretty low so yeah the hope is that there are more than three or two and I believe there is That's all the questions that uh, we have so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, TJ. And just for the so the folks out there know, TJ is a second year. So I'm just really looking forward to seeing what you're gonna accomplish. This is an incredible project and thank you so much for telling us about it. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'd love to come back and share the results once I get those. We would love to have you, just let us know when. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we are now on to our main talk for the evening. Um, we're going to be hearing from Andrea Williams, who is the Director of Biodiversity Initiatives with our state CNPS office. She has two decades of experience in science-based public lands management, monitoring rare plants and plant communities, carrying out project compliance surveys, uh, mapping and removing invasive plants and responding to landscape level threats. She's worked in partnership to design indicators, metrics, status and trends for land health. She's led volunteers in botanical inventories um, to improve the quality and quantity of data submitted to the California Native Natural Diversity Database. And she teaches plant identification, field methods and invasive plant management planning. She is really an amazing and wonderful person. She has done so much for CNPS and native plants and I am absolutely thrilled that she is here to talk to us about Bay Area wildflowers. So Andrea, please go ahead and start sharing. Great, thanks for that tremendous introduction Vivian. I, I really appreciate it. I am going to share my screen and start my slideshow and talk about the wildflowers of the Bay Area, which I could do all the time, as long as my technology works, even when my technology doesn't work. But first, um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the Bay Area and the original stewards of California's biodiversity. So the, the lands of the Bay Area, as you can see from this map, which can be found at native-land.ca, um, this, this area has always been culturally diverse. It's tremendously rich biologically and culturally. And today I'm speaking to you from Chochenya Olane lands. Um, our local land trust is the Sogoreate Te Land Trust. And um, please visit their website and consider paying your Shugumi land tax. So California itself was founded on the eradication of diversity in the service of greed. And in 1848, California was ceded to the United States as the spoils of the Mexican-American War. In 1850, uh, California passed an act for the governmental protection of Indians. It criminalized loitering and vagrancy. Essentially, it provided for slavery for the native peoples. Even though California was not a slave state for black people, it was essentially a slave state for the indigenous people. Um, in 1851 and 1854, 52, the federal government negotiated 18 treaties with 139 tribes in California. It set aside between 7.5 and 8.5 million acres in reservations. And the 
California senators stalled those treaties in secret. Um, and in between the time when those treaties were planned and the Rancheria system uh, began, which was essentially a reservation system for California tribes, um, there were only 7,500 acres set aside and tribal populations plummeted between 85% between 1850 and 1890. And, and some of that was due to uh, John C. Fremont, who the shrub Fremontia was named after, who our scientific journal was named after. And that's really the reason why we're changing that name. So the effects of systemic racism on the distribution of public lands and the siting infrastructure are still present. I grew up in San Francisco. I grew up with the Embarcadero Freeway um, standing between uh, neighborhoods mostly with people of color and the bay um, and after the 1989 earthquake that freeway wasn't rebuilt um, same thing with with um, 980. Biodiversity itself is correlated with human health if you have more biodiversity in an area you're the people that live there are healthier so biodiversity protection and restoration has to include environmental justice this photo is taken at China camp um, and that's just a reminder to me to also acknowledge that um, that the Asian Exclusion Act essentially of the, of the, I think the late 1800s was one of the first immigration laws that banned people um, from entering the United States based on their race. And um, Asian, Asian American and anti-Pacific Islander hatred still exists today. So everything that we can do to um, make biodiversity access and equity a part of the work that we do is, is something that we're going to do. Biodiversity itself encompasses the variety of life at all scales, uh, ranging from single genes to species to whole ecosystems. And to talk about biodiversity today, I'm really focusing in on the wildflowers of the Bay Area. And to do that, the really common flower families. So excluding the grasses, even though I love to talk about grasses, um, they're not particularly showy. So I picked some of the most common and most showy flower families in the Bay Area, and I'm gonna be talking about um, representatives and how to tell some of them apart, really to take you a little further along your journey to plant identification. So I'll talk to you about how to meet a plant, um, to understanding the relationships that these plants have with each other, to train your ability to notice the little things and how to get help from people or from computers and then putting it all together. So talking a little bit about recreating responsibly and some community science opportunities for you to dig a little deeper. So everybody knows California poppies, they're our iconic state flower, um, but really California itself is a global biodiversity hotspot. We have the most biodiversity than any other state in the United States and that includes Hawaii. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area itself is home to over 2000 native plant species and that's more than um, a lot of other states have. So over 1300 plant species grow in California and nowhere else in the world. And that is absolutely tremendous. So that's kind of a daunting task if you don't know plants very well and think that you might have to learn, you know, thousands of plant species, you, you kind of don't. Um, really the, the great way to start and birders do this a lot. Um, they learn the birds that they see all the time. So learning the common plants and learning the families that they're in um, conveniently, the largest plant families are really well represented in the Bay Area. And species numbers that are on the following pages are, are mostly for the herbs. I tried to stick to that. So there are, particularly for the, um, the pea family, there are some trees and shrubs um, that I'm kind of leaving out. So learning the features that you need to tell those common plants from others. So once you feel comfortable, that you know, you know, a, a suite of species looking at, okay, this plant is like this other plant, but it's not the plant that I know. So looking at things like the habit. So how does it grow? Is it sprawling along the ground? Is it climbing? Is it, um, you know, a woody plant? Is it a little tiny herb? And then the habitat, where is it growing? Is it growing in a wetland? Is it growing on a dry grassland? Is it growing in serpentine soils? Um, the number and arrangement of petals and leaves is deeply important to, to plant identification. And then anything else that you can note. So it's got a strange texture, it's really bristly, or it smells like vinegar, or it's got really milky sap, or the seeds are a certain way. Um, and certain um, 
characteristics are important for different families. And I'll talk about a lot of those today. So taking pictures and uploading your observations. So part of the joy of discovery is sharing your discovery with other people so that we can all be excited about it together. Um, Calflora and iNaturalist are two great locations for, for plant photos and getting help with plant identification. It's really important when you're taking photos to give a sense of scale because it's really hard to tell how big something is from a photo. Um, there are going to be some things that aren't capturable in photos. So things like texture and scent are really, you can't really tell that from a photo yet. Um, I like to be lazy but suspicious when I'm identifying plants. And that means that I will let the computer, particularly iNaturalist, will suggest um, what species or what genus something might be. But I'm always a little bit suspicious. So when it suggests something to me, I'll go and check the, the description of the plant. Does it have the right number of petals? Are the arrangement of leaves correct? Um, do I trust that this is really the species that that's either the computer or somebody else is telling me that it is? Um, sketching is an ac excellent alternative, but it's a lot less shareable. But I, I started um, way back in college um, in a plant identification course, uh, sketching a lot of plants, and it really focused in um, my eye for detail because you had to make sure that you were getting everything right. And so you're really paying attention to the flowers and the leaves. So diving right in to one of the biggest plant families in California and in the world, the Asteraceae or the sunflower family or the daisy family or the dandelion family. So what you think of as a flower in this family is not actually a flower, it's an inflorescence. Um, and there are some major um, tribes or subfamilies within this, and you can usually narrow it down to one of these. And that does help a little bit with, with identification. So this is, these are four of the subfamilies or three of the subfamilies and then kind of hand waving all of the other ones. Um, so upper left, number one, Agosaurus grandiflora. This represents the chicory subfamily. This is a really tremendous um, relative of the dandelion. It's kind of our, our native version. So you can notice the white puffball that, that is characteristic of this family. The strap shaped flowers that you might consider to be petals are usually yellow, but sometimes they're white or bluish purple. And the members of this family have milky sap and very few plant types do have milky sap. So when you see that, it's, it's a characteristic that you really wanna pay attention to. Um, a lot of them are non-native, but there are some really lovely native examples. Um, next up is the aster subfamily. So daisies, sunflowers, cudweeds, goldenrods, tar plants, and yarrows. They'll usually have showy ray flowers, which are the flowers on the outside, and tubular disc flowers. So if you think about a sunflower and you've got the bright yellow, um, what look like petals, but are actually each individual flowers on the outside, and then the dark brown, each one of those is a flower on the inside. Those are the disc flowers. Next up is the thistle subfamily. So plants that we call thistles are usually spiny in some way. The flowers are often red to purple, but they can be yellow in some of the non-native star thistles. Um, some of them are non-native, but there are some really lovely native examples, including several rare endemics in the Bay Area and very often those are found on serpentine. The photo I have is of a Western thistle, um, Circeum occidentale. This is pretty common on a lot of the grasslands. Um, the other ones, so there are a few species that don't fit into these categories. They're not very common though, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about them. The photo is of a uh, trail marker plant or trail plant, Adena colon bicolor, um, really tiny flowers, but, but really noticeable leaves. So this, this family, Really, you know, because there are so many plants represented in that family, you might think it's really hard to identify them. And sometimes it is, but there are a couple of really key features that you want to take pictures of. This is goldfields, Lasthenia californica. So goldfields, they can make goldfields. They're very common in the spring. We've kind of passed their season a little bit. Um, but it's really important to take a photo of the leaves and the underside of the flowering heads um, because, let's see if I can get the laser pointer going. 
these fillery, these things here are fillers. And so how fused they are to each other and the arrangement of them is important in telling what plant these are. Um, there are 15 kinds of filleries, or 15 kinds of filleries, 15 kinds of gold fields in the Bay Area, and seven of them are rare. So California gold fields itself has three subspecies, and two of them are rare. So these tiny annual plants, they grow en masse in grasslands, often in serpentine or in seasonally wet areas, and both of those habitat types are kind of rare themselves. Um, this photo in the center of a, is of a small Helithodes moth. This is a specialist on this family. And so you'll see it a lot um, kind of flitting about on these flowers. I want to talk a little bit about um, serpentine, our state rock. And uh, it's great to have the, the intro by TJ talking about serpentine. It's high in heavy metals and low in nitrogen and calcium. It's really hard for plants to grow there. Um, because they need nitrogen and calcium and not nickel and magnesium, those are often toxic. So a lot of them have specialized adaptations. Because that's the case, they can be somewhat resistant to non-native plant invasions. And as, as a result of that, they have tremendous spring wildflower displays. So getting out to Edgewood Park and Serpentine Loop Trail, those are both really great places to see serpentine plants and some plants that you won't see anywhere else. So that's the aster family. I want to talk about the pea family next. So the Fabaceae, they're kind of three main subfamilies of beans, and they're all united by their, their fruit type, kind of that long pea pod or bean pod looking thing. Um, first up is the mimosa subfamily. So acacia, mesquite, and mimosa, generally woody plants with palm pot flowers and pinnately compound leaves. Mostly what we have in the Bay Area are non-native acacias, but um, there is a lot of native mesquite and fairy dusters that grow native in Southern California. Um, the redbud subfamily, uh, more typical pea family flowers, but simple leaves. So usually when you think of this family, you think of compound leaves in some sense. Our Western redbud is, is a really great landscape plant in a lot of areas, but a lot of people still plant the Eastern redbud and I, I kind of wish they wouldn't. Um, then we have the pea subfamily, which is really what you think of as the traditional pea flower. Um, so having a banner, wings, and keel. So there are a couple of types, main types. There are, um, there's the group that has their compound leaves ending in a bristle or a tendril. So sweet peas and vetches. This is a photo of our native um, Lathyrus vestitis. So pennate leaves, um, the, the description on the right has the pennate leaves and then on the left, um, alfalfa, which is a, a palmately compound leaf. So penna like a feather, palm like a hand. Lupins, clovers, milk vetches, um, lotus and indigo bush. They're each in their own tribe, but they're all united in having mostly compound leaves. Um, a few of them do have pinnately compound leaves just to keep you on your toes. So this family is really fantastic and varied and I've, I've grown deeply fond of clovers. Um, there are 54 kinds of clovers in the Bay Area and 34 of them are native and three of them are rare. So that's, that's a lot, it's a lot of clovers. So you think of clover, you think of one thing, and then to find out that there are several dozen is, is kind of mind blowing. This is a photo of our, probably our most common native clover. This is tomcat clover. Um, the leaves, again, the leaves on the underside of the flowering heads are critical for identification. And so what you wanna look for is this, this is an involucral wheel. So some of them have it, some of them don't. The way that it's arranged is really important for identification. And then the calyx, which is this part of the flower, and then the leaves as well. So sometimes they ask you about what this plant is doing in flower versus fruit. Some of them inflate, some of them, the flowers are reflexed. Um, really tremendous diversity in this genus. Um, tomcat clover has bracts that are fused below the inflorescence, and then it's got this kind of distinct patterning of lobes on the calyx. A lot of butterflies and moths use clovers as host plants, and, and of course the nectar supports tons of pollinators. The pea family, you know, I talked a little bit about the things that you need for identification. 
Um, in the non-clovers, a lot of times it's the number of flowers, where and how something is hairy, what the calyx looks like, the arrangement of the leaflets, and then the, the relative size of the inflorescence to the leaf, and sometimes what the fruit looks like. So really a lot of things to, to look at for this family. All right, moving on to the carrot family. So most of you should be pretty familiar with the carrot family because you probably have eaten a lot of them. So parsley, cilantro, carrots, dill, fennel, all of these are members of the, of the APACE. Um, they used to be called the umbelifery because their flowers are arranged in an umbel, which is like an umbrella. It's got kind of this central stalk and then these radiating limbs out where the flowers are held. So like a little umbrella. And there again, I broke these up into four main groups. These are not taxonomically based, but I like to split things up in ways that are meaningful for me that kind of helps. And hopefully it's helpful for you as well. So starting out with the, um, the lomations and the tausias. So these are biscuit roots and umbrella warts are kind of the common names for these. Um, usually low growing with compound umbels, so not just one umbrella, but an umbrella that has umbrellas at the end of each of the ribs. Um, the fruits are variously ribbed. Sometimes there are little threads on them, sometimes broad wings. So if you think about a, a caraway seed um, or a coriander seed, they have these little, these little thready ribs on them. Um, they're, the seeds in this group are sometimes or actually often pretty important for identification. A lot of them have a really strong parsley smell. So that's another key feature of this group. Um, this is a photo of, I think, Lomatium desicarpum. Yes, Lomatium desicarpum. I put it right there. Um, Sanigals and Oringos. So these are a little bit different than some of the other um, APACE. They usually have leathery leaves and they're very often tooth lobed or dissected. The flowers are generally pretty small and they're yellow or white, sometimes purple. They don't really have the sheathing stem bases that are typical of this family. So if you look over um, in this cow parsnip, you can see this kind of inflated stem um, sheathing base. And that's another characteristic of the family. But the Sanicles don't have it. The Oringos, also called coyote thistles, um, don't have it. Some of those are, are sold as ornamentals because um, they're really quite striking in their look. Um, moving on to the kind of small white flowered carrot family, um, American, American carrot and hedge parsley are the small carroty natives. They have really ferny leaves and clustered flowers that turn into spiny fruits. And there are a lot of non-natives that look similar. Um, tall sock destroyer is one of them, Torlis, um, hedge parsley, birch herbal, um, a lot of these uh, plants that get stuck in your socks and, you know, the natives do that too. This is Dacus pusillus or American carrot. Um, last one over here, this is um, cow parsnip. So there are a, a group of tall, usually white flowered plants, um, angelicas, cow parsnips, lovage, hemlock, sweet sicily, yampa. They're usually over a foot tall, so they're, they're you know, tall. Um, with pinnately compound leaves, except for cow parsnip, which is usually just really strongly lobed or toothed, um, and the seeds that are smooth, but with ribs or wings. Um, and they do have, as a, as a whole, broadly sheathing stems. This is one of my favorites in the carrot family, um, partly because of its name. They really do have the best leaves in this family. Um, this is purple shoe buttons. People don't call it purple shoe buttons much anymore because Nobody really has shoes with buttons. Um, Sinicula bipinatifida is kind of the scientific name that, that most people know, but I like to say purple shoe buttons. Um, there are 70 members of the carrot family in the Bay Area, including 11 sanicles, and three of them are rare. Purple shoe buttons, um, it's really distinctive. Purple flowered sanicle, twice pinately lobed leaves, which is what bipinatifid means very often this bluish cast, and I just, I find the look very pleasing. Um, the anise swallowtail finds the carrot family really pleasing as well, and will lay its eggs on a lot of members of the family, including um, non-native fennel and parsley. So you see this a lot um, 
even going to baseball games in Oakland or in San Francisco, there's a lot of fennel along the shoreline and you'll see um, just a ton of Anna's swallowtails out that way. Um, list over here of some of the, the cultivated for food or spice um, in the carrot family. So for this family, the bracts around the flowers, the arrangement of leaflets and the type and surface texture of the fruit are all the important things for identification. So there are surprisingly few plant families that have four petaled plants. Um, so mustards are one of those groups. The poppy family is another, and then I'll talk about the, the third main one after this. But um, the mustard family, the Brassicaceae, again, dividing it into four. Uh, first, the toothworts and tower mustards. So these plants very often have uh, basal and stem leaves that are kind of toothy to lobed, few to no hairs and white flowers. There are two main kinds of um, of fruit shapes in this family. There's siliques, which are long and sleek, and then there are silicles, which are kind of circular. So that's kind of a mnemonic to remember that. These plants are really great hosts for butterflies. Um, the margined white and the Sarah orange tip are two of them. Most of us will see a lot of the, the non-native cabbage white because of the, the commonness of, you know, Brassica oleracea in all of its forms. Um, being a host plant for that, that, that species as well. Moving on to the rock cresses and wallflowers. These plants um, have mostly basal leaves. They're usually toothy. And if you look really closely at them, they have super fancy branching hairs. So not just a hair sticking up, but a hair that's in a, the shape of a star or a hair that's, that's branched in some way or, or a hair that looks like an asterisk. So I really encourage you to, to find some rock cresses or wallflowers and, and take a good look at them. The cresses usually have purple or white flowers. Um, wallflowers generally orange to white and their seed pods again are siliques. They'll really often grow in rock crevices or outcrops, which is why they're called rock cresses. Um, moving down to the, the leafy stemmed and fat fruited. So not a lot of this family will have silicles um, or some other variously shaped. This is one of our fancier um, fat fruited mustards, this is fringe pod. So you can see the, the perforations around the, the edge of that pod. Um, so this includes the pepper weeds and fringe pods, the water cresses, yellow cresses, and tansy mustards. They all have lobe to ferny leaves that go up the stem. Um, pepper weed fruits are often heart shaped and fringe pods are kind of these lacy circles you'll see there. Some of them are more sausage shaped. So in particular, the, the cresses have sausage shaped fruits. Um, there are a lot of non-native pepper weeds and then there are other, um, a lot of the non-native mustards will be yellow flowered with siliques um, instead of these uh, silicles. So super fancy flowered, um, jewel flowers and colanthus, um, or I forget what the common name of colanthus is. There are a couple of them. Uh, California mustard, I think, which doesn't really do it justice. Um, basal and stem leaves that are toothy with simple or bristly hairs. What looks like the flower in a lot of these are, are an inflated colorful calyx. So this purple part right here is actually the calyx. And this little white veiny thing is the flower poking out of it. Jewel flowers usually have purple or white flowers. Sometimes they're yellowish. Um, Colanthus usually yellow to white, but sometimes they're purplish or the calyx is colored and the flower is not or vice versa. Um, so really important to note those things. The leaves are incredibly important actually in identifying uh, this family because a lot of them do have flowers that just kind of look like this little moo, which is adorable. Um, seed pods again are siliques and sometimes the direction that they point is important in identification. Um, they're, they're always making new species. So there are a lot of jokes and botanical memes about Brassica oleracea and its many forms, so cauliflower and cabbage and kale and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and collard greens and savoy cabbage and kohlrabi and dailan, all from the same species. Um, jewel flowers are also making wild splits, but they're all different species, not the same species. There's a lot of um, recent work as well on California mustard that's showing some hidden diversity and that, that what we consider to be one species might actually be uh, five localized uh, types 
of a plant. Um, Mount Hamilton jewel flower and a lot of the jewel flowers that grow on serpentine are really masters of disguise. They have um, these really neat leaves that are often, you know, orange to purple. They'll have these toothy ed edges that look like just little rock flakes on serpentine. So unless you're really looking for them, it can be hard to find them. And then I just really love these little elephant trunk saliques. Um, so each, you know, kind of each mountain in the area has its own type or two of jewel flower. So if you look down this list, you'll see, you know, a, a couple of rare jewel flowers in your area. Um, and again, most of them are serpentine specialists. So really, really neat genus of plants. All right, so the other, I promised you the other four petaled wonders, this is the Anagraceae um, or the evening primrose family. So again, splitting it into four major types and I know you're probably tired of that by now, but I'm gonna keep going with it because I got a thing. Um, sun cups, low growing plants, yellow flowers with a globo stigma, only really it's not a stigma, but it just looks like a stigma. Um, this little boop at the end here. Some of them are leafy annual plants, um, like the one shown here. This is, uh, I think, Taraxia ovata. And then uh, some of them are rosetted. Uh, well, yeah, some of them are rosetted perennials like this one. And then the, the Camasoniopsis um, are usually annuals that, that are kind of bristly. Clarkias, a lot of us are really familiar with Clarkias. They're super showy. They're um, annuals with simple leaves and, and pink or purple flowers. Tremendous local variability in addition to variation between the species. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, willow herbs are similar, but generally with much smaller flowers. The, the exception to that is the California fuchsia, which I'm sure a lot of you have in your home gardens. It's a, it's a tremendously ornamental plant. Um, they vary greatly in size from just a few inches tall. The Epilobium minutum is actually minute. Um, at, or in some of them are several feet tall. So that I had a Epilobium brachycarpum in my yard last year that was taller than I was, which is really, you know, not saying a lot, but still uh, more than a few inches tall. Um, often late blooming, a lot of them have fluff tufted seeds and can be known as fire weeds as well. Um, evening primroses, really hardy um, plants in the Bay Area, usually yellow flowered here down south. Um, there's a species that can be white or pink, and a lot of them are, are planted by Caltrans because they're pretty durable annuals, but they're, they're fairly weedy. And this group does really hybridize pretty readily, so you gotta be kind of careful with moving these plants around. Um, this group will host the white line sphinx moths, which is a, a great reason to have them around. And some of the, some people who have it in their yards will watch the flowers open as the moths come coming in or do that out in the wild as well. So this family is, is really hardy and I'm a deeply lazy gardener. So I, I love plants that are hard to kill and easy to grow. And, and this family really does fit that bill and they're, they're pretty as well. So elegant Clarkia is, is quite elegant. Um, usually the, the flowers or the, the leaves coming up will have kind of a purplish veining and then they'll grow into this really nice flower stalk of these spoon shaped petals. There are 70 members of the evening primrose family in the Bay Area, and that includes nearly 30 Clarkias, and five of those are rare. Um, they can be tricky to identify, and you may need to see plants in bud and in fruit, and count the sepals or the seams in the fruit to tell some of these species apart. But this one is, is generally pretty easy, and then the, the way that the sepals split or don't split is another key feature of that. So a lot of these popular natives for the gardens, I mentioned the California fuchsia, Farewell to Spring and Red Ribbons, as well as the, the Elegant Clarkia. Um, a lot of these evening primrose family plants can be found along roadsides, in particular the, um, the this one, Enothera alata. Um, all right, pause for some water. Now we have two plants or two uh, different families kind of split down the middle here. So this side is the broom rapes, this side is the borages. And the thing that these two families have in common is that they used to be four families. Um, so with some recent, uh, well, not so recent anymore, but recent for a botanist, 
um, genetic work and redistribution of the families, the um, types of owls clovers and, and paint brushes and birds beaks and, um, and plants like that that were either partially or totally parasitic that used to be in the Scrofulariaceae got moved into the broom rape family or the, um, with a lot of these, these really parasitic plants. So the totally parasitic, lacking chlorophyll, relying on their hosts for nutrients. Um, they're usually host specific. They can be identified by the number of lobes on those tubular flowers and the length of the stalk. And so there are some ground cones, which are um, used to be the Boschniakias, which is my, um, my name on iNaturalist. And um, now they're the Copsiopsis. And then these used to be Orobanki, which is, was the name of the family, the Orobankaceae. Now they're aphilon, which means without leaves. So again, these used to be in the figwort family, um, and they got lumped in with these based on the way that they both um, can be parasitic, which is pretty special in plants. So the true borages, either, these are the ones that most botanists will just kind of say they can't identify them, and I'm one of those people. Um, their reproductive parts are usually hidden within the flowers. Um, those flowers can be white or yellow in fiddlenecks or blue in hound's tongue and forget-me-nots um, or sometimes a mix of those colors. The fruits are nutlets, which are often needed to identify the species, so it's not enough to see the plant in flower. You have to come back when it's in fruit and get the nutlets and look at um, you know, whether the, the scar is a ridge or a pit and how reticulate it is, and I kind of give up at that point. So there are, you know, there are plants that we all have trouble with, and, and this is one group for me. So the, the group on the bottom here, these used to be in the Hydrophilaceae, but apparently um, there's such a fancy um, inflorescence, this scorpioid cyme, or this coiled um, way that the flowers are arranged, it puts them together with the traditional borages. So this, this group, um, Phacelias, baby blue eyes, Pretty typical, the flowers are usually white to blue or purple and the fruits are just capsules. So it's a lot easier, but the, um, the reproductive parts are, are um, poking out. So they're, they're plainly in sight where they're not in here. So this family, oh my goodness, really, really great looking flowers, but kind of hard to tell apart sometimes. So these are two different species. Um, and the thing that you have to look at is this shaggy beak tip, which is um, purple owl's clover or Castilea exerta with this little um, round stigma poking out. And then this is dense flower owl's clover, um, just more of a sparsely hairy tip. The hairs are a little further down and then the stigma just barely poking out. So two different species, they look almost exactly the same. Um, a lot of the, the paint brushes are kind of the same way. There's a certain um, amount of color on the bracts and how much the flower is pointing out of the calyx and the arrangement of the leaves and how curly they are. So, um, you know, it seems like as we're getting further along this journey that the plates are getting a little harder to, to identify. Um, the board family is nutty. A um, lot of lot of nutlets on it. Um, 138 members of the broomrate family. That's the previous one, so I think I just forgot to change the wording there. Um, 128 of them are native, and 13 of them are rare. So there are nine types of Phacelia or nine types of Nemophila, which are usually represented by these baby blue eyes, and then 35 Phacelias. The baby blue eyes have two varieties in the barrier that are that are differentiated basically on flower color. So they will grow together and flower at the same time, but they appear to remain distinct. So this is variety Menziesii, which is the traditional baby blue eyes. And then this is variety Adamaria, mostly white with this purplish veining, um, which is white baby blue eyes. Doesn't make that much sense, but there it is. Um, moving on to, I think this is the last group of families. So these are lilies and irises. Um, delving a little bit into the monocots here. 
Um, on the left hand side, we have the lilies. On the right hand side, we have the irises. I'm going to start with the irises because um, this shows the important point that irises have petals on top of the ovary and lilies have petals below the ovary. Um, so you can see here the reproductive parts are above where the petals are. And then here and here, you can see the petals and then the ovary is actually down here. So blue-eyed grasses and golden-eyed grasses, not grasses, of course, but irises, um, both whorls of the flower look similar. So it looks like it's got six petals. Three of those petals are actually petals and three of them are um, sepals and you can call them tepals or you can call them perianth, um, but you can also just call them petals if you really want to. Um, down to the true irises, most people can recognize an iris. The flower parts are really strongly modified, often in really striking and beautiful ways. And the, the leaves, the bracts, the length of this tube from the flower down to the ovary, those are um, really important for identification and then where the flower appears to come out of the bracts um, are really key to identification. Flower color is super variable in these plants. So there are you know, flowers that are supposed to be blue that are yellow in some areas and flowers that are supposed to be yellow that are blue in other areas. Um, so those are the irises kind of broadly. The um, lilies, again, can be broken in, in a pretty clean way. Um, some of them have the perianth in oh, two whorls of three that are dissimilar. So the calicortis, the mariposa, or star, or globe lilies, the three petals look very different from the three sepals. And the flowers in here vary greatly in color and form, but they often have dramatic markings. So the early flowering fetid adder's tongue is one. Um, this is Calicortus luteus, but there's a Calicortus, I think Calicortus superbus, that mostly grows in Southern California that, that displays tremendous variation in coloration from white with brick red markings to purple with yellow markings. And it's the, the shape and the, the shape of the nectary and the arrangement of hairs that you really need to, to tell them apart. So um, really not what you're used to looking at when identifying plants. Um, the sixers, so in what we generally think of as traditional lilies, both whorls of the flower look similar, so they look like they have six petals. Um, fritillaries and lilies will often have world leaves and sometimes the flowers are pendant. Um, they're mostly colorful, so this is <clears throat> Fritillaria finis. Um, tremendous year for fritillaries this year. They didn't mind the drought at all, but they're pretty much done flowering by now. Um, red Clintonia is a really striking redwood forest dweller that is probably going to start blooming pretty soon now. Um, strongly glossy basal leaves and magenta flowers, but again, in those groups of six. So, circling back to the, you know, just kind of how do I start learning the common plants, then branching out. No, well, okay, pun intended, um, to learn the features that you need to tell the common plants from other plants, and then taking pictures and uploading your observations so that you can get some help if you need it, or that you can provide some identifications to help other people. Um, so for unknown identifications, you can take pictures or use something like your hand or a quarter for scale, because like I said, it's really hard to tell, um, to tell size from a photograph. Um, so showing the leaves, taking a habitat picture. If your phone is dead, you can draw a picture. That's of course, assuming that you have a paper and pencil in these days, which maybe you don't. Um, and then knowing your location is also key. So making sure that you, um, when you go to identify it, you can actually narrow down um, what the plant might be based on where you are. You can recognize similarity to the plants that you know. So we went through a lot of the major families some of the genera or some of the tribes of the plants of the Bay Area today. Um, you can also use Calflora or iNaturalist to explore related species until you find what looks like a good match. You can read the description of the plant and look at some more photos. And if you don't feel comfortable that that matches what you saw, if it's got a different number of petals or if the arrangement of the stamens is wrong or whatever it is, you can go back and, and try again. This is not a this is not a life or death situation here. Um, 
a couple of the community science projects that we have going. Um, one that I am super excited about. Um, we had a really traumatic fire season last year and um, our relationship to fire has really changed over the past, you know, even the past hundred years, much less the past thousand years. So fire used to be essential to life for humans um, and now it has become a danger and it, we view it as, as solely destructive. But for the plants of California, it's very often necessary for them to grow and reproduce. And there are a subset of plants that are fire followers and they'll only come up or they'll come up in great profusion after a wildfire. And a lot of the wildfires in these areas have been of low to moderate severity um, and burning away from not around people's houses. And so we've started this fire follower program to get people out to areas that have burned to record the response of nature there and to share that information on iNaturalist. And I spend um, a fair bit of time, you know, in the evenings watching a Giants game and, and spending a few hours going through and identifying a lot of the plants that, that people post because that's how I um, unwind in the evening. Um, another uh, slightly more involved um, community science project, which some of you hopefully have participated in. Amy Patton is our great um, rare plant treasure hunt program manager, taking people out and re, well, you know trying to find old populations or populations that haven't been seen in a while um, and to map new ones. So making that data um, available and submitting it to the central database in California, um, the California Natural Diversity Database. So you can join a hunt um, this past year with uh, COVID shutdowns, we had a lot of people actually going out on their own to try and find these plants. Um, if you feel like you can, you can coordinate a rare plant treasure hunt or steward a rare plant. So if there's a plant that you see, um, you know, is growing near your how house, you can adopt it. You can gather information about changes in uh, population size or pollination or seed production, um, any of those things. So really valuable. Um, volunteer assistance. So I, I want to leave plenty of time for um, questions. So I'm going to wrap up just kind of reminding the journey that we took today. So went through a lot of the common flower families, the sunflower family and its, and its main tribes, the peas and carrots, the mustards, the evening primroses, broom rapes and borages, and lilies and iris talked a little bit about um, ways that you can meet new plants and understand the relationships to plants that you know, um, doing some work on noticing the little things and then getting help from people or computers. So putting it all together, um, just reminding you to recreate responsibly. So staying on paths when you can, um, particularly in burned areas, not trampling the flowers that you and other people are there to see and then some ways that you can maybe dig, dig, dig deeper, get involved with some community science um, that's going on or, or volunteer with your local chapter on some stewardship or in the nursery or leading a hike if, if that's what you can do. Um, so just a, a reminder, um, this is my contact information. I'm a Williams at cnps.org. I'm the director of biodiversity initiatives for the California Native Plant Society. We do a lot of great work, as, as Vivian mentioned, protecting California's native flora and um, just promoting the excitement that, that I hope that we all feel for California's native plants. Um, if you need me on iNaturalist, just at Boshniakia, and I will uh, show up and comment on your observation. Um, so that is all I've got. And I will take a look at the questions. Thank you, Andrea. We have a number of questions. Great. And the first one is about milky sap. Does it have a particular function as opposed to a solid stem? Yeah, so milky sap, um, kind of like bioaccumulating metals, is um, a defense against insect predation. So um, the milkweeds are a lot of one of the plants or types of plants that people know have milky sap. That's why it's called milkweed. Um, and the monarch butterfly caterpillars will actually chew through the, the midrib of the leaf um, to cut off the supply of milky sap so they can more safely eat the leaves. Um, the dandelion family is kind of, kind of has that similar 
um, milky sap for protection. Um, some of the plants like, uh, I think, periwinkle and some of the bell flowers um, will have milky sap, so the, the dog bane family. Um, generally poison and poisonous to, to people and some people can have kind of allergic reactions to that sap. So um, filled with a, a latex and so it's probably similar to a, an allergy to rubber or latex. Thank you. And um, someone asked if you were willing to share your slides because they would like to make ID cards for the different plant families. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, I don't really have a problem uh, sharing the slides, um, just as long as somebody doesn't kind of steal the presentation and, and make it their own. But uh, maybe I give my own flavor, so it's really the presentation and not, or the presenter and not the presentation. Or maybe it's both. I don't know. Well, if you know, we can talk about that and put them up on the website and or the selected slides and let people who attended this know. Yeah. Okay. And another question is, you know, this whole presentation was about learning plant ID by getting to know plant family characteristics. Do you think beginners miss this important background when they learn plants just by using iNaturalist for ID? Um, I think if they rely on and trust the artificial intelligence suggested identification, and that's what I meant about being lazy but suspicious. So um, for a lot of things, particularly for animals, INAT is great. For plants, it's a little more complicated. Um, and it can look, you know, a lot of plants can look similar depending on the angle that you take, take the photo. So it can usually get you pretty close, um, but that's where, you know, going and reading the description or looking at other photos and really comparing it to what you have is important. Um, and so a lot of when I'm identifying plants for folks on INAT, um, if it's not the plant that the AI suggested and it's pretty clear that they just, you know, accepted that suggestion, I'll talk about why it's not that plant and why it is the plant that I say it is. So part of, you know, part of, I, I think the work on INAT that particularly skilled folks um, on this, um, on this, I don't know what you call it. It's not a call. <laughs> I'm so used to Zoom being a call. Um, but in this group, you know, if you if you have skill at all and you want to share it with people, I really do encourage you to go on to iNaturalist and you can, you know, narrow it down by the area that you're familiar with, but go in and, and help people identify plants and really bring them along because we do, you know, as, as much as we try to, you know, keep botany programs alive in colleges and universities, not everybody is, is going to colleges and universities or not everybody has access to that program. And so the extent to which we can, um, we can teach people in a friendly way and, and share our excitement about plants, um, I really think that that's valuable. Yeah, it is exciting. So um, what exactly is a nutlet? So a nutlet is a little tiny seed that looks like a really small piece of gravel. Um, it's just a name for the type of fruit that this family has. And I say nutlet without ex explanation because I, I forget that not everybody knows what a nutlet is. Um, and it's just kind of fun to say nutlet. Um, so usually it's a, it's a hard sided um, seed of some sort. So if you look at your borage plants, um, if you have borage growing or the, um, the Pacific hound's tongue is in fruit right now, it has these kind of four hard-sided seed balls and those are nutlets, usually in the, um, the Plagiobothrys and the Cryptantha, more of the traditional um, borage plants, they're kind of triangular um, or pyramidal in some sense. Um, and it's just, the, um, it's just the name for that fruit. Um, there's um, a, sort of been a general discussion on YouTube about owl's clover and someone specifically asked, is owl's clover something that would be a good ground cover in a garden? What are its water requirements? But isn't it semi-parasitic? Yeah, it's one of those that, that doesn't have to be, but often is, and sometimes they can be tricky to grow. Um, so 
particularly the um, yeah the Orobank ACE in general are hard to grow. I find the the owl's clover type of um, of castilea a little easier to grow than the paintbrush type. Um, I think the paintbrush is is a little more needs its host, um, but I haven't found them growing in gardens very well. And it looks like um, I might have to defer to folks and um, recommend that people go to calscape.org. And um, I can type that into the chat or maybe Judy can. Um, oh, that's exciting. Um, thank, you, thank you, Judy, for typing that into the chat, calscape.org, and you can look up a native plant and see if anybody's offering it for sale and maybe some of the germination and growing requirements for it. I'm mostly a wild plants kind of person. So when people start to ask me about horticulture, I get a little, I don't really know. So where is the place on your la on the last slide that you showed? Um, I did not take that picture, but I believe it is down near Joshua Tree. Um, it's somewhere in the desert. Okay, it looked a little bit like some place I saw in Death Valley several years ago, but I was just curious. Um, another question from YouTube. What Bay Area wildflower identification books would you recommend to take on a hike? Um, there are, it depends on what part of the Bay Area you're in. There are some really nice floras. Um, if you're into kind of trying to keep plants out um, where you are, um, you can go to the main CNPS website or your chapter website and take a look at the books that are offered for sale. Um, I think that the wildflowers of the San Francisco Bay Area, I think is what it's called, is a, is a pretty good, more photo-based reference. And then um, the, the central office of CNPS is currently working on a, a wildflower book for most of California that features a lot of the, um, a lot of the common wildflowers. So going through kind of species selection and description about, you know, what of the thousands of wildflowers um, in California are we gonna include in this book? But um, hopefully that'll be out sometime, if not this year, then early next year. Okay. Um, as a um, non-botanist trying to learn about um, plant identification, I think in one, one presentation I went to someone and this is something I observe, a lot of people are always looking at leaves to identify plants. But I was, you know, that if some leaves are similar, but I heard that leaves are much more adaptable than flowers. I mean, that plants seem to evolve leaves very quickly, but flower shapes are usually conserved. And one of, is it true that one of the first places to look is to look at flower shapes in terms of deciding what family something is in? Yeah, that's generally how it's done. Um, looking at the flower to determine what family or even down to genus um, in the flower. But a lot of times when you're trying to differentiate between species and a genus, you'll need to look at the leaves. So thinking about something like a sedalsia or a checker bloom, the leaves are actually really important for identification. And the flowers are all kind of the same shape. Um, and the same look to them with really tiny variation. And so you're looking at, you know, the overall plant, how dense is, how dense are the flowers packed? You know, are there bracts, um, you know, how bristly are things? Is it laying down or is the stem erect? You know, lots of, lots of things like that that are characteristics that um, even though they're, they're fairly variable by habitat, um, the plants are pretty reliably growing in different habitats and, and keeping these differences. So I mentioned one of the mustards earlier, um, looking at kind of a, there's a difference between the coastal colanthus and the inland colanthus, colanthus lassiophilus, the California mustard. And the differences are actually in the lower stem leaves, which are gone by the time that the inflorescence comes up. But there's a difference in the lobing there and it's actually, it's, it's preserved um, regardless of where it's growing. So a lot of times people, when they're trying to figure out, you know, is this based on the environment or is it based on, um, you know, actual genetics, they'll grow these plants in a common garden so that the variation in conditions is gone and you can see, you know, is, is, is the leaf shape really true to the plant 
or is it just based on those environmental variations? Oh, and Radhika put an important um, comment in the chat that once our field trips open up and we're starting our planning on this, joining a, field, a, few, a, a few field trips gives everyone a great introduction to common wildflowers. It's like a beginning birding walk. So going, yeah. on a, going, on a, going on a hike with people who are knowledgeable people identifying plants can help you a lot. Definitely, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, so we're starting to, to get people out together, you know, when, when we had COVID and uh, we were worried about people clustering together in groups and we, we still kind of are, and we weren't really sure, you know, we, having people all clustered together looking at a flower didn't seem like the best idea, but um, things have gotten a lot different. We have some better guidance and a lot of us are getting vaccinated. So it's great to be able to get back out together and and kind of celebrate the flora together. Oh, here's a, okay. Are monkey flowers part of one of the, one of the families that you mentioned or is it one of the other families? Yeah, that's one of the other families that I didn't cover. Um, they got, they used to be actually in the Scrofulary AC with the, the Castilea, the paintbrushes. And that was part of the, the blow up of that family. They got placed into the, the I think the Fry Maceae now, um, the monkey flower family. Uh, when, how common is it for species to hybridize, like the baby blue eyes and owl's clover that are so similar? Yeah, it, it really varies um, by the by the family, by the genus, um, even you know a little less broadly than that. So the um, thinking about some of the common the the ones that are, that hybridize really easily, the the Anagraceae, particularly the Enotheras, the evening primroses they'll hybridize super easily, um, which is why you need to be kind of careful about moving those plants around. Ceanothus are kind of the same way. A lot of the Arctostaphylus will hybridize with each other. Um, so there, there tend to be families that will hybridize more easily. Um, and actually the, the baby blue eyes and the owls clovers are, are not that way. Um, so, you know, some of the lilies will hybridize, the irises hybridize like crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could kind of mentally go through in my mind, um, oaks, oh my goodness, the oaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, salvias as well. Um, yeah, is there a way to tell when you're looking at a hybrid when you're in the field? So I have a few rules of botany and I think rule three is if you can't key it well, then it's a hybrid. Um, so if it's kind of intermediate between two species, so Sinicula, um, Sinicula crassicollis and Sinicula laciniata seem to hybridize fairly easily. I don't think any of the other sanicles do, and maybe they're not actually hybrids, but they look kind of halfway in between um, the two parents. And so that's kind of a, a good way to tell. Uh, another and question about how can I join a rare plant, plant treasure hunt? Does CNP, the state organization, organize any of them, or is it only in the chapters? It's the, well, it's a little bit of both. So sometimes the, the chapters will organize their own rare plant treasure hunts. Sometimes individuals will kind of adopt a, a location and do rare plant treasure hunts there. But a lot of the times um, our rare plant treasure hunt program manager will um, arrange them. And I think uh, she has the, 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 um, the list or the calendar available. So if you go on the main CNPS website, cnps.org and search rare plant treasure hunts, you should be able to, to get that information pretty easily. And um, we, if, we, if we have one in the chapter, we will put that on our um, chapter news list and our Facebook page and our website. So as we said before, sign up for our chapter news list and um, you'll find out about them. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Put the link in the chat. And then I saw Ginger's uh, comment about learning to identify wildflowers is easier than birding because the plants don't fly away. That's you know one of the reasons I became a botanist. Um, I've been out with some butterfly people and they just go running down a hillside after a butterfly. And I'm like, I'll just stay up here with my plants. 
and I'll go char charging off and, and snapping my ankles. Okay, do we, oh, okay. How many, um, how common are hybrid plants in wild settings? Yeah, so that kind of goes back to, you know, which, which plants hybridize more easily. So they're fairly common for certain types of plants. Um, and actually the, the, our scientific publication for the state, which used to be called Fremontia um, and now will be called Artemisia, which I hope doesn't um, spoil anybody's surprise when they get it. We're doing a, a, um, an, an article, not an article, an issue on cryptic diversity that covers a lot about hybridization. Um, so there are a, a lot of different instances of hybridization. Um, a lot of the grasses will do it really easily. Some of the, a lot of the wind pollinated plants will hybridize pretty easily. Um, and some of that is just due to the availability of pollen um, and, and not being, you know, moved back and forth by a specific pollinator. So oaks, pines, um, grasses, all wind pollinated, uh, hybridizing very easily. And then the, um, as I mentioned, the Enothera, the Ceanothus, some of the Arctostaphylus, um, really common to see hybrids out there. So I, I worked for 10 years up on Mount Tam and I think year five, I, I felt kind of comfortable with the oaks and then year eight rolled around and I found that I didn't really know the oaks as well as I thought that I did. And a lot of that was due to hybridization and, and just how variable those, those oaks are. I think we may have exhausted the questions, which is really great because we're about at our wrap up time. So I will turn it over to Vivian. Well, I just wanted to thank Andrea and also TJ, I think you're still around. Um, you're, I really appreciate the time from both of you. I think. Both of you are inspirational in different ways, and I am just excited to get out there and try some more of this. <laughs> it's challenging, I think, but I, Andre, I just love the way you, you were able to sort of take everything apart and show us the, the high level things to look for. So very much appreciate that. And thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we have more talks coming up. If you wanna review Andrea's presentation, because there was a lot of great information there, it is recorded, it is on YouTube. You can watch it anytime and as many times as you want to. Um, and um, I hope to see all of you guys in person at some point in the future. And uh, thank you again. And I guess we're gonna wrap it up for tonight. So good night, everybody. And I'm gonna end this. Thanks, session. Andrea. It was great. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Appreciate uh, being oh, able to- actually, this, before I end, just wanted to point out if anybody wants to save the chat out because there's some useful information there, you can do that yourself. If you go down to the bottom corner of Zoom where you you know type in your own message, there's a dot, dot, dot option. And if you um, click on that dot, 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 it lets you save the chat out. There's an option to save chat. So for those of you who wanna save some of that, the links and things, that's an easy way to do that. And Andrea, you're getting a lot of thank yous and compliments on chat in both YouTube and on Zoom. So thanks again. Great. Hi, Chip. <laughs> and uh, I guess I will truly end the session now. So see you all virtually.